In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we invite you into our presence, wherever we are, participating in Know Your Feet. We thank you for being able to host this series to inform about and spread the Catholic faith to our sisters and brothers. We ask your blessings on our presenters, our listeners, those who facilitate this production, that we may be guided by your Holy Spirit in presenting and receiving your word. We pray that all who benefit may come to a deeper understanding and appreciation of the Catholic faith that will guide our living. We make this prayer through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son and our brother. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hello, and welcome to our third episode in the Know Your Faith series on Synodality. I am Deacon Hilary Bengoche, and I'm greeting you from our home office. And it's a bit raining outside, so you may hear some raindrops. We are in the rainy season. And in this episode, we are going to be dealing with the third watchword of synodality, which is mission. We, in the first episode, we dealt with communion, and then we dealt with participation, and today we are dealing with mission. We have a very great program planned for you. Uh, we have some exciting things. As normal, we have Father Don Chambers clips, and we're going to have guests. And we have a special today in that we are going to have the, a, a clip of the Archbishop speaking about mission. So stay tuned and hope you enjoy today's program. I invite you to look at this clip of the Archbishop speaking on the occasion of Mission Sunday where he explains to us how much we benefited from the missions from different parts of the world that came to build a church here in Trinidad and Tobago, and how much we also contributed to mission in other parts of the world. And most of all, that he is inviting us to become a mission church. I hope you enjoy it. Have a look. Mission Sunday, October the 24th, very important day. We remember the missionaries that came, that helped us to be church here in Trinidad and Tobago, from Spain, from France, from Ireland, from different parts of Europe, even from America. Missionaries that, that have built our church to make it what it is. More recently, our missionaries have been coming from Africa, and, and from India. But we have also sent missionaries out. We sent to, to Russia, to the Caribbean, and, and to Africa, and other parts of the world. Let us pray on this Mission Sunday for all the missionaries that have come, and those who have passed on, and those who are still alive, who have helped to build our church here in Trinidad and Tobago. Let us pray for the missionaries that we have sent to Nigeria, We've, through the Holy Ghost and, and to Paraguay and to other parts of the world. Let us pray for them. But let us pray also that we will become a church of mission. That we will send missionaries consistently out as we receive missionaries consistently. On Mission Sunday, we support the missions of the church and the Holy Father asks us to contribute specifically. And I would ask you, please, just consider what you can get. Put it in an envelope and drop it off to your church when you go to Mass or drop it off if you're not if you're not attending mass this week because you can't get in drop it off anyway or catholic tt everything that goes in from sunday 24 to the following saturday will be for the missions thank you very much for your contribution and thank you for supporting our missionaries so Welcome back to our third episode. And in this episode, we are discussing the third watchword in synodality in church, which is mission. And today we have a good buddy of mine, a recently ordained deacon, just like myself, 
Joachim Hernandez and Joachim operates out of the Santa Rosa Arima Churches Cluster and Joachim has had many years experience working with the church in the trenches and now he's a deacon and he is very very qualified to speak to us about about mission as always we play a little clip from father don chambers reflections on synodality and we are playing the clips that each guest likes and and joachim has selected a clip and i am going to switch to the clip we're going to listen to the clip for a little while and then i'll come back on and joachim and myself we will chat about the clip so bear with us if there is this communion among us, the people of God, then the mission of the church must be dance-like. That is, engage in an exercise of deep, respectful listening to one another. And that's what the synodal journey is about. A journey of consultation for three years but a journey that must take place beyond the three years. We must engage in an exercise of deep, respectful listening to one another. The church must slow down. The church must engage in this slow dance into people's lives by communing and participating in, the, in their lives. How can we slow dance into people's lives? How can the church slow dance in the people's lives? There are three ways which we have been reflecting on this week. And we see this also in Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, 13 to 35, the story of the Emmaus disciples. The first way is we must create space for people, for people whose lives are messy, murky, and marginalized to tell their story. That's the first way of missioning. We must go out and create a space. Second, we must listen to them, to their stories. And three, we must share our faith stories in response to their stories. We see this threefold character of mission in Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, 13 to 35, which becomes a model for its dance-like mission for the church, first in this narrative. The question of the risen Jesus to the two disciples about what they were discussing as they walk along paves the way for them to tell their story of the impact of the suffering, death, and empty tomb of the risen of, of Jesus of Nazareth, the impact it had on them. Two, the risen Jesus patiently listens to the disciples' stories. Listen to them venting and even accusing him of being ignorant. Three, Jesus responds to them by sharing his faith story based on the Hebrew scriptures that the Son of Man was destined to suffer, to die, and rise on the third day. Beloved in Christ, the way in which the risen Jesus danced into the lives of these two disciples becomes the missionary model for the church. The missionary model for the church is for us to go and slow dance into people's lives. The Synod Handbook tells us, the church exists for, to evangelize. We're not a social club. We exist for evangelize, to evangelize. We can never be centered on ourselves because we're not a social club. Our mission is to witness to the love of God in the midst of the whole human family. And this leads me to ask the question, beloved, into whose lives is the church called to dance? The church is called to dance, as I've been saying, into the messy, murky, and marginalized space of people's lives. Lives that are chaotic, 
disordered, messy relationships of families, workplaces, and society. Beloved, it is for this reason the church is involved in ministry to migrants. It's for this reason the church is involved in ministry to refugees and prisoners, those who are socioeconomically poor. That's why the church is involved in justice ministry, just to name a few, because the church is called to dance into the messy, murky, and marginalized aspects of people's lives. So thank you so much, Joachim, for agreeing to participate in our program today. And thank you for selecting that clip. As I listen to that clip, I, I really would like to ask you, you know, what it is about that clip that resonated with you? Why did you like that clip? Uh, Hilary, thank you for inviting me to share. And uh, mission, getting into the trenches, and especially the cardinal, you know, saying that he comes here with the logic of the, of the gospel. You know, he's not a diplomat. And as you know, I've been in the trenches, not only in, in, in ministry, but in my career as a, as a soldier in the Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago Regiment, um, I'm familiar with mission. You know, we're given mission every day. And wow. the mission is engaging. It engages you, but it engages all of you and those who are around you. Uh, so that is why this particular aspect of, of, of Father Don Stork really, uh, you know, interested me. Uh, especially when he gave those three, those three aspects that we needed to do, you know, where we needed to, to create a space for the persons to tell their story. And more important than that is to listen to them uninterruptedly, be actively present to them, and then sharing your own feet story, you know, with them. Joachim, thank you so much for that. And thank you for advising us. I never knew that in the military there are also missions. Um, so when you say that, and from your experience both in church and in the military, what is it, how is mission different? How, would you, how, would, how do you approach mission differently now that you're more in church than you're in the military? Well, one, the, the mission here is the mission of the church, all right? And the mission of the church, um, it's, we, we are called to, as followers of Jesus to be his disciples, but we are also called to make disciples. And okay. as, Father Don, as Father Don shared in the handbook, you know, the synodal handbook speaks about evangelizing, right? We, we are not a social club, all right? And in the army, you're not a social club either. Okay, but you are called to whatever the mission that has been assigned to you. All right, you need to, to go and, um, and, and function with that, and you need to go to execute it and to achieve that mission. The difference being is that that mission changes. That mission changes in the church. The mission, you know, remains, you know, as to come together as one body, different persons, different persons coming together as one because that's the unity of the church. And we are called to come together, and that's what the synodal process is, coming together in the same part, in the same part, you know, so that we can go there and reach those persons that we are supposed to reach. As Father Don continues to quote from Matthew Kelly, you know, um, meet those persons in the messy, you know, um, marginalized spaces of their lives. We need to go down, in other words, in the trenches. I, I, that, that terminology of the messy, marginalized um, places of their lives resonated with me as well, Deacon. And, and I'm wondering, you know, up in, up in your cluster of parishes, which groups particularly you would think that you have to, you know, go out to meet? Are there any groups in particular that you can think of in your cluster of churches that the church is being called to really go out, not just wait on, but to go out and meet them. Well, before I answer that, let me just correct one thing. So it's the Santa Rosa Malabar cluster. Okay. Uh, so you need to correct that. 
because then, you know, I may be in a messy, murky place. <laughs> <with my head. laughs> so, yeah, what going out there to meet the, those who are dispossessed, those who are on the fringes. And as you know, um, Pope, John, Pope Francis, when he came in to the papacy, he spoke about coming out of your comfort zone, coming out of the church building and going to meet those persons where they are because they're not coming into the church. And therefore, we, we have to go out. And that, that too, and I may be hopping on in the trenches, but that is a, as a concept. It gives me an imagery of, of, of going into the trenches, going to where these persons are, where, where the strongholds are, because they are comfortable in that stronghold, but we are called to reach out to them. We are called to, to bring God's grace to them, and we are called to bring the light to them as baptized Catholics, as baptized Christians in the world, and by our own lives, we need to witness to them. You know, they it, too also witness to us, huh? so it's not a one-way street. I like that point. And you know something? Uh, recently, in one of the newspapers, there was a report from the Postal Service that in the Arima district, to which you belong, part of it um, is one of the highest incidences of crime. So, and, and you know, I'm thinking about the young people. Um, do you have, is there, is there a, a challenge in your area to meet the young people who may be at risk in going into crime? Yeah, I, there, there, is a, there is a challenge because um, there isn't a, a structure right now in, in our parish, in our cluster, you know, that, that treats directly with that. Now, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, you may know some persons and you, you reach out to them. But as for a sustained uh, practical effort, um, that, that hasn't happened. But, you know, there is also, there's always hope because a few years ago, the men's ministry of the Malabar Parish, when the crime was very high in the Samaru village, they went in there. I was part of that grouping. And, you know, they, they witnessed... To the, to the community, and after a year or so, you, you saw changes. Wow. It really changes to, to the intervention, but it would be the intervention plus other social justice uh, intervention that would have brought about a change. Yeah, I, I like that point, but it's not just going out with just preaching the gospel, and I like that point, that it also involves some elements of social justice. And one of the things that the church coming out of the synod is preaching is for us to have, for all the commissions to work together. And I like that point. Probably, how, did, how were you all successful in getting social justice to work with, let's say, the gospel people to reach to this community that you spoke about? Well, what happened that day, in that time, the, the men's ministry in Malabar would have made... Uh, connections with a family there who would have been impacted by crime. And that family opened their, 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 their home and there was a mass used to be celebrated there once, um, once per month. And the entire community was invited. But before that, there was um, like an awareness to invite the community from before, which would have been done the day before. And the men's ministry would have gone out to different homes there and uh, walking the street, inviting persons and saying the rosary, praying the rosary. And so this is, these are men witnessing to other persons there and they found that there was, a, there was a good response. And other than that, while walking around, they also saw what was happening in the communities, the state of some persons, how, how they were living and all of that. And uh, social justice action groups like St. Vincent de Paul and all of them were brought into uh, that, that regard. And they worked together to, to satisfy the needs that they were seeing, you know, of, of some of the residents, you know, there and those who were impacted, you know, by the life of crime that was happening, especially within the, the young men community of that, of that village. Oh, thank you so much for mentioning that about the men's ministry, Joaquin, because we here, yeah, and I come from the St. Joseph uh, cluster, uh, we have been having some challenges in getting our men's ministry off the ground. And, 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 you know, listening to you, it really gives me a certain motivation to say that 
probably we should involve them in some something like what you are saying because it may have a greater attraction okay as we close off you know what words of advice would you leave with our listeners um on church and mission what what, what is there any message um that you would like to to leave with us before from us yeah sure mission is very important to be lived mission um, is not something that up in the air mission is something that is achievable that you have to believe one that you are you have all the equipment necessary and once we go on mission in the church the the only equipment we need is that of the holy spirit uh, within us ordering us guiding and directing us all we have to do um hillary is have our hearts open to be obedient to the holy spirit thank you joachim and thank you for guesting with us in this program we appreciate and we really praying for you and your work in the santa rosa cluster and may god bless you and may god make your mission successful all the best thank you mate. thank you very much hillary all the best to you as well god bless Today, we also have with us Rachel Poon King, and Rachel prefers to be called, or people refer to her as Shelly, so I'll be speaking to her as, as Shelly. I know Rachel very well. Rachel is in our parish, St. Joseph Parish itself, and Rachel is, is and has been very much involved in the Synod process. Rachel has single-handedly coordinated St. Joseph Parish's efforts. And she has also been involved at the suburban vicariate level. Rachel, welcome and thank you for guesting with us today. Hi, morning, Hilary, and thank you. So, Rachel, let us, as we as it's customary in the program, let us have a little, a look at a little clip of Father Don Chambers's video on mission as it relates to synod. So, so let's have a look at that. The, the preparatory document, synod document, has this to say. It says, living a participative and inclusive e ecclesial process that offers everyone, especially those who, for various reasons, find themselves on the margins, the opportunity to express themselves and to be heard in order to contribute to the edification of the people of God. It is for this reason many dioceses, including the Archdiocese of Port of Spain and dioceses throughout the Caribbean, have already opened and have open and honest conversations with some of these groups that, I've, that I mentioned. Beloved, the mission of the church must not only be observatory, but participatory. An observatory mission is based on contact, but a participatory mission is based on communion, dancing, participating. We must use the spiritual skills of storytelling and story listening to dance into people's lives as a pathway towards their healing and reconciliation. The synodal journey signals to the church that we're moving too fast. Way over our speed limit, the church needs to slow down. For just like life, the mission of the church isn't a race. The mission of the church is a dance. So the season of Lent is like a traffic cop on the highway, slowing us down and diverting us and telling us, get off the highway. Go on the winding, potholed, riddle parochial road 
where you will be able to notice and pay attention to those who are wounded and broken. I'm sure you have had the experience of driving on local roads and noticing things that you don't see when you drive on a highway. In concluding, I leave with you to contemplate another reflection from my blog on Synod. And it's called the Synod Word. The Synod Word. Five different and unique letters in relation with each other. Like the meaning of the word common road, all five letters dance together to create a movement and a meaning. Synod is like letters coming together to form words, words coming together to form sentences, sentences coming together to form paragraphs, paragraphs coming together to form a chapter, chapters coming together to form a story, stories coming together to form a book, books coming together to form a library, libraries coming together to form a collection of stories, all different yet similar, but together they tell the story of humanity, the story of the church, not my story, not the story of one race, religion, ethnic group, community, family, or nation, but our story. Wow, Richard, that is unbelievable. You know, as, as, as we looked at Father Don Chambers' reflections on the Synod, and his, his nice way of articulating these things. But as we put it together with your experience, Rachel, of being so intimately involved in the synod process for the St. Joseph Parish, and also at the vicariate level, what thoughts come to you when we speak about mission? What are the, what are the things that, that you are, are, are thinking of or or you are taking away in your heart? Well, I would start off um, by, I guess, sharing a personal, my personal experience um, going through Synod, um, going through the whole process. And, you know, we started in November of 20, um, 2021 and came into, down into February and March of 2022. Mm -hmm. And throughout that process, you know, listening to people in their consultations, reading feedback on questionnaires. For me personally, I got a sense that you are being called to do something. When this is finished, there's something that is waiting for you at the end. And you have a different role to play. So that was my experience on a very personal level when it, when it comes to mission and what we are being called to do. Um, having, as you said, having been involved in the synod process on a parish level as well as on a vicariate level, I got a sense that we are being called on a bigger level, on a, as a parish, there's so many things that we are being called to do. And now that we have finished this um, first part or, or the beginning of the process, it is now time for us to transition to the next phase. That is putting into practice what we have heard. Mm -hmm. I, that, is, that is very well said. And I think mm -hmm. putting into practice what we have heard is what Father refers to as mission. How do we now take all that we we have received and make it into a mission for us to be able to go forward? So, in the um, consultations, people ex expressed their joys, their hurts, their pains, and also to some of their dreams. And while I was going through that 
on the or wh while we were reviewing the feedback on a parish level um, and we were writing our writing our report it was very evident that there were some things that um, we as a parish we had already started working on some of these things so that was that was really good news uh, there were other things that we other points that came out and we realized okay we're going to have to maybe work a little bit more on or more, focus a little bit more on those things so putting into into practice what we have heard on a parish level we had already begun things such as focusing on the youth so we created our youth ministry we had um already put in to to train the need for a space for people to come and pray quietly. So um, our parish has, has been working on an adoration space. Um, people also talked about um, formation, wanting more faith formation on an ongoing basis. So we had already um, looked at how can we serve our congregation in that way? And, um, Father Matthew had organized for a Bishop Barron series. So we had that. And also to now we have formed, which it was just perfectly timed in that everybody, not only in our parish, everybody will be able to access forms and get that sort of ongoing formation. So the first part of it was to put into practice what we heard. Okay, so now we have to do it on a parish level as well as on a, an individual level. Because, you know, very often in the consultations, um, we would have heard things like, well, the church has to do this and the church should do that and the church doesn't do this. And in one of the consultations, I remember it quite clearly, um, one of the um, participants said, you know, it begins with me. I guess I have to do something as well. I can be more hospitable. I can be part of a ministry. It's up to me to, to start something, you know? So um, I think as we talk about mission, we're going to have to look at it at two levels. With, on the level of the church collectively and on an individual level. And I think having completed the, the, um, the report and we've given feedback to our parish, I think now we have to continue giving feedback because we would not have touched everybody in the parish in the feedback. And so now we have to find ways of um, reaching more people. How do we tell people or how do we communicate to people that we have heard you, we have listened, and we are now doing something? So on a very um, small level, for example, I, um, I'm part of the Children's Liturgy Ministry or group. And so what we would have done, we met as a, as a team this um, this weekend, and we discussed some of the findings of the Synod, and how does that relate to our group? And what can we do moving forward? You know, and one of the key things when we talked about youth involvement, before we would not have had the, the younger people in children's liturgy present. When I say younger people, we have um, some teenagers who assist us um, on, a, on an ongoing basis. So we invited them to come to our meeting and give us their view, share with us, you know, what we were planning. Does that make sense? And it was very insightful, um, the, what they shared with us. And in fact, it um, helped us to forge our plans going forward. So it's little things like that that we must now take and put into practice and refine as we go along. 
I, I like what you say about that mission now has to be at different levels. And I particularly like what you mentioned about the individual level. From your involvement, uh, do you foresee any challenges to get at the individual level persons involved in mission? Well, I'm an, op I'm an optimist by nature. Having said that, though, I do recognize that there are a few challenges to get persons involved um, on an individual level. As um, we would have heard referenced in Father, Cham um, Father Don Chambers when he talks about how our life has gotten so busy. You know, we, we're on that fast track highway. And it is true. So how do we get individuals involved? Because, you know, they have only time to come to church um, and, you know, somebody reaching out to them and asking them, well, come and get involved. Um, they might say, no, 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 I don't have time for that. So I think what we have to do is to show everybody that it is possible to get involved in a group. And it is possible to balance everything. And I think not only that it's possible, but it's beneficial to to balance everything, you know, because again, I will draw on my personal experience. Sometimes when I was asked to participate, I would say, you know, can I really do this between my work commitments, my family commitments, and now to add something else to the plate? Is this is this possible? And I have found in every time that I've gotten involved, somehow things worked out. And you found the time. And so I think we have to communicate that to individuals um, that you have to make the time. And once you make that decision, the time will, it, it will appear. You will find the time, you know? Thank you so much for that. Shelly, and thank you for guesting with us today. Thank you for your insights. I appreciate it. And I look forward mm -hmm. to working with you, Shelly, on making this whole a process a success. I would, before we end, though, Hillary, I would just like to um, share one thing which we shared from our parish level. Sure. And you would recall we talked about the butterfly effect. Yes. And um, while I... I, I know it comes from the, you know, from the business world. I think it's something that we could, we could apply to our context. And, you know, as you would recall, we talk about the butterfly effect being the idea that small things can have a nonlinear impact on a complex system. Um, and that whole butterfly effect is imaging the butterfly flapping its wings causing a typhoon and of course well of course that can't really happen you know a butterfly flapping its wings can't cause a typhoon but what it wanted to symbolize is that the butterfly this a small event such as a butterfly flapping its wings can result in something bigger and I think for us I would like us to contemplate on that butterfly small changes will have a big effect on our parish level, on our church level, and on an individual level. I, that is so profound, Rochelle, Shelley, and thank you for guesting with us. And no we shall be working together going forward. Thank you, My Shelley, pleasure. for agreeing to come on. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. And hello, and back again. And we have on this final clip a, a wonderful guest. We have Jillian Ruben from the Holy Cross Parish in Santa Cruz. Now, I have a very good friend who is very much involved in the synod process in Santa Cruz, Mark Camino, a good friend of mine. And he told me, if you need to know about synod in Santa Cruz, call <laughs> Jillian.
So we are so happy to have Jillian. Jillian has been very much involved in coordinating the entire synod process in the Holy Cross Parish. And Jillian is also a teacher for over 30 years. And so therefore, we are fortunate to have her on board. And Jillian, thank you for coming on and welcome. Thank you for having me, Deacon. It's a pleasure to be here this evening and to just share on uh, the Synod process in Holy Cross and uh, what we were able to accomplish and what we hope to do moving forward. Right. Now, we have been doing the three watchwords. We have done communion, we have done participation on week two, and this week we are dealing with mission. So I like to think of mission as a going forward. After after all that we've done in the Synod process, you know, when we speak about mission and your experience, coming out of your experience in the Synod process so far, how do you think we have to approach mission? That's a wonderful question, Deacon. And I think the approach for mission starts with formation because we cannot go go out on mission if we are not formed in our faith and if we are not uh, fully cognizant of what is expected of us so that uh, for members in the parish which um, who would want to engage and we would want all members of the community to be engaged in mission I think that formation identity formation who we are what by virtue of our baptism we have been called to do and uh, certainly formation in terms of how to effectively do it. You know something, one of the challenges that I know many parishes say about formation is that let's say baptism, you mentioned baptism. You know, parents come in and it's like, and Father, Father Don Chambers mentioned it. It has become like a tick. It has become yeah. like a... Um, it's just part of a, a process, and it's not really engaging. Um, mm -hmm. As a teacher, Julian, how can we make our faith formation more engaging to individuals so that they really are empowered to go on mission? Okay, well, faith formation begins uh, really with families who bring their children for baptism. So there we have a first opportunity to engage maybe via mentorship programs, engage members of the wider church community with families who have brought children for baptism and to journey with them. So when we talk about journeying and this synodal journey, we have to be prepared as parish community to journey with each other, to mentor each other, to build up each other, to engage with each other before we can go on the margins. I, I, I like that because, you know, very much we are speaking and coming out of Synod, we're saying that there are these groups uh, that have been, for whatever reason, have been marginalized. Uh, but what you are saying is that before we can even begin to approach these marginalized groups, we have to prepare ourselves and that that we have to engage in formation. Yes, yes, certainly. And this formation, that's not an easy thing to do. You know, I mean, even with COVID, now that we are hopefully, please God, coming out of COVID, how can we get parishioners to come back, to be engaged, to be part of this faith formation that you speak about and prepare themselves for mission? Okay, well, I would, I, I like the word engagement because one of the things we want to accomplish in parishes is really participation by all members of the community. No longer must involvement in ministry be the purview of a few persons in the parish. So we would have to look at ways to engage as many persons as possible in the parish, in ministry. We have to look at um, forming people's identity. Because once you understand who you are, because many times in the parish, 
even as baptized Catholic Christians, we don't have a sense of who we are and what we have been called to do. So there must be continuous formation, reminding people of our identity, reminding each and every one of us of the call on our lives to go and to announce the good news to others, to ourselves, first of all, and subsequently in these concentric circles, to those who don't even come into our churches and who have been marginalized either by their own actions or who we ourselves have marginalized by our actions. Yeah, you know, that, that, that last part, um, and I like how you, you separated between those who have marginalized themselves, who have chosen to be outside. Mm -hmm. and, but in many ways, sometimes, and you know, the, the, the diocese has this, this three ages, and hospitality is it. Yes. But coming out of many of the conversations I have heard uh, yeah. coming out of the synod process is that when persons come, they meet a, a sort of, to use the word, non-hospitable um, greeting. Yes. What what are you what is your parish doing so that we can and, and probably be for the rest of us for us to be able to to have a church that is more welcoming even with the soft skills? Yes, and, and that is such a profound question. And you know, a question that calls us really to examine ourselves and to see what we are doing right and to see the many things that we have not as yet got correct. So, and you are quite correct, Deacon. Many people talk about less than warm receptions, even as vi visitors, excuse me, to our church. Many people talk about being absent from church and no one even noticing their absence. So if we cannot be hospitable to members of our own community who attend mass, how can we be hospitable and extend what we have been asked to do in terms of going on mission if we cannot even get what is happening at the level of the parish, correct? Yeah, you know, as you said that, recently a friend of mine sent me a clip from Bishop Barron, and Bishop Barron was speaking, apparently there's a big research, a pure research done in the United States as to why persons are leaving the church. And while, while there are a number of things that are beyond our control, you know, like, like what is canon law and so forth, mm -hmm. but, in the heart of it is hospitality and yes. customer service. And yes. he used exactly your example, that sometimes persons mention in the research that they have stopped going to church and no one ever called them to find out why, what has happened to them. And they just, so they said, well, they would not appreciate it. And they said, however, if I stop buying from a company, the company, yes reaches yes. out to me where are we in? Me. Yes. why can't we take a, a page out of out of that attitude and to see how can we incorporate that in our churches and i agree with you deacon and if we really take that approach we would extend the approach how can i extend or how can we as members of a worshiping community extend hospitality to those on the margins how can we do it and therefore we have to come to terms with understanding what it would take that it would take an appreciation of being willing to listen to what persons are saying, persons on the periphery who may say some things that we may be uncomfortable with. And once we listen, remember, we have to understand, we have to create the space for them to tell their stories without being judgmental, and once we have allowed and accepted persons without judging them, we then start to share our own stories. 
and share our stories of God's work in our life and accept people as they are and invite them to enter into that relationship with the Trinity. So hospitality is what would be needed in order to let people be comfortable in being vulnerable and in maybe considering for some, um, in a particular way, considering coming back and entering into relationship with those of us at the level of the parish. You know, you know as a teacher, and probably you can help me here, a lot of the youths are saying that mm -hmm. they are not being welcome. Now, there are different views on that, um, yeah. but a lot of the youths believe that we are not welcoming to youths for whatever reason. What do you think? And as a teacher, Gillian, what can we do in our parishes to be more welcoming, more hospitable to the youths, bring them into into our churches? Well, I think, um, first of all, we have to be willing to listen. You know, so much of the synodal journey is about listening, really listening to what in particular your question is about the youth. So listening to what they have to say to us and creating a space for them to share their stories, validating their stories and encouraging them, encouraging them to become actively involved in the life of the church and again, many people have a lot of different views on this. Some of them talk about a lack of commitment, but uh, we are not going to um, say that uh, there is a lack of commitment and we give up on the youth. We have to keep encouraging them. We have to create activities for them to become involved in. We have to move out of the way many times. Most, I would say all of the time, move out of the way and allow them, allow them to participate. So, um, and many people have um, problems with that. You know, um, some people tend to be a little bit territorial. We don't want to encourage that. <laughs> but the youth, we must listen to their feedback. And many of them were able to speak very, very extensively during the synod consultations on how they felt and how they felt marginalized, how they felt judged, unwelcomed. And we have to make a commitment to deal with that and to fix that. So that is going to be part of what we need to look at moving forward. They are marginalized. They consider themselves marginalized in many instances. And yes, we yes I agree with you. And then after that, that, that like Bermuda Triangle there, after confirmation, we yes. have to have something, and you speak about continuous formation. We have to have some sort of program how yes. we can take post confirmation, yes. and then also that we don't because many many youth tell us as well that confirmation actually turn them off of church, and mm -hmm. and that is something that is very worrisome to me. Yes, that is sad. That is really really sad. So it means. We have to listen to what they're saying. We have to take another look at our programs and we, ha we have to see if there is any value in what, um, in what they have said. But certainly there are many gaps in faith formation. There, is, there are gaps, uh, I would say, between um, baptism and first communion. Then you have gaps between first communion and confirmation. And then you have a gap for after confirmation, which is the one you're talking about, and our role as um, parish would be to look to see how these gaps could be filled in order to, as much as possible, form the faith of the members of the worshiping community to empower them to go on mission. So it, it is, in my humble view, a sense of letting people understand what discipleship is, understand that the church 
has been called to mission. The mission has a church that we are the church and therefore we have been sent on mission and that we are therefore sent to evangelize, but we have to be prepared and we have to know how to do it and how to do it well. And this is what I'm saying will take formation at the level of the parish. Very, very good. Just one closing remark, Gillian, in your experience in the Senate, you know, many people, many persons had said probably it was not the ideal time to have the Senate because of COVID. Other people said it was the ideal time. From your experience, your actual experience, what would you say um, in your experience was the entire Synod experience for you? What was it like? Well, I would say that I thought that uh, the level of participation would have been greater. But again, there was some hesitation, for instance, with face-to-face -face consultations. And uh, um, so they were not very, very well attended. Um, we also had some hesitation with filling out the questionnaires. Some people found the questionnaires a little bit cumbersome. But in spite of that, I would say that my experience was a positive experience. And I think I speak on behalf of the coordinating group, as well as the support team that we put together in order to facilitate the process. What I would hope, however, is that the process does not end here. Yes, and that's that it. we look, exactly, that we look at moving forward that we present proposals for moving forward. And as a parish, that's what we are looking at now, looking at what could be implemented in the short term, in the medium term, and in the long term, with respect to particularly fundamental question number two, which dealt with this vision for the church in the future. So we are looking at putting um, processes in place that would somehow or the other, to some degree, implement the recommendations that came out from our parishioners who participated. Thank you so much, Gillian. We've run out of time. I could sit down here and have a whole program with you, and I'm going to call you back for the next <laughs> program. But thank you so much for guesting with us on this program. Mark Hamino was correct. You are an ideal person to have on the program. Thank I you, don't thank you, thank you, thank you, Thank you very much, Deacon. It was a pleasure being here. I'm sorry we didn't have more time to really go into mission, but I know there would be other opportunities where we can share with our people how to prepare for evangelization. And I look forward to those opportunities being presented. Thank you again. Thank you, Gillian. We have come to the end of our three episodes in this Know Your Faith series on Synodality. Moderating these three episodes have given me a new appreciation for Synodality. I now better understand the three watchwords of communion, participation, and mission, and what it means for the local church going forward. I thank Father Don Chambers for his insightful lectures, without which we would not have had the three episodes. I want to thank my guests as well, who really, through their experience, their understanding, expanded upon Father Don Chambers' insights. And most of all, I want to thank you, our viewers, who have taken the time and who have joined us and journeyed with us over these three episodes of the synodality process. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is Hillary Bengote and saying bye for now. <laughs>